I'm in Esbjerg, Denmark, and this is the world's first giant heat pump to serve as a central heating system and provide warmth through pipes to an entire city. So instead of using coal to heat, this city will now use renewable energy provided by wind turbines because it's Denmark and they are masters at the wind turbines. How does it work? What's the genius idea and secret components that make this project viable? And of course, how efficient is it in energy consumption? I'm Ilya Toma and I came all the way to Denmark to have an inside view of this world's first giant heat pump. Engineers who build this system will provide me the answers. Moreover, I will get insights from the engineers from Dean Forsening, the district heating service of Esbjerg, the ones who must manage the work of the giant heat pump in the city's system with other parts of it. It is a hugely interesting system and balancing it is a work of art on itself. And besides the answers I will get directly, I will also try to portray some graphics with additional explanations so everyone can understand visually the beauty of this system, world's first on this scale. The heat pump system is located in the port of Esbjerg, Denmark, on the shore of the North Sea. Today the port is the primary port for shipping Denmark-made wind turbines. The giant heat pump has been constructed by MAN Energy Solutions and is located in a new building, part of the district heating plant operated by Dean Forsening, which is actually located on the territory of the port. First of all, we were met at the site by Moritz Lindermann, the project manager from MAN Energy Solutions, who gave us an initial guidance inside the huge plant. The green lines on that side, what you see is everything green, as there is uh, district heating water. In general, our green lines are always having something like water medium inside, and everything which is grey is a gas medium. Here mainly, of course, CO2, but we have some little pipes going through, it's only instrument air. And I must tell you that at the moment of our filming, the installation work at this new heat pump and all the piping around it was approaching its final stage so there was still some work being done as we toured inside the location. So this is the second compressor, the second part? That's the this second one, yeah. unit, correct? It's exactly the same. And in the corner behind them we have the receiver system, what I told you, to get the CO2 out um, for the cleaning purpose of the uh, seawater system and what we see here, the evaporator. That's actually the storage container later on for the CO2. Well, let's have a quick reminder of what a home heat pump is. Basically, it is a circuit with refrigerant that can be manipulated to pass from liquid to gas state and vice versa, and in the process to absorb the heat from a heat source medium, amplify it by applying pressure with a compressor, and then transmit that heat to a final medium, and do that all over again in a cycle. A refrigerator can absorb the heat from the initial source through an evaporator, also called a low temperature heat exchanger. And that initial source can be outside air, water or just a warmer medium underground. When the refrigerator passes that evaporator, absorbing the heat, it becomes gas, because it has a different boiling point. Then that refrigerator turned into gas has a common property for gases, if they are pressurized, they get hot. So here the compressor comes into action, heating that gaseous refrigerator by pressure. Then that hot refrigerator gets into a condenser, also called a high temperature heat exchanger, where it releases the heat to the final medium, usually air or water. After that the refrigerator would pass to an expansion valve, cooling abruptly by losing pressure and becoming liquid again, so it will be ready for a new cycle of absorbing and transporting heat. That basic principle is valid for all the heat pumps, no matter the size, but depending on the climate and the intended functions, there are variations. In what is the primary heat source, in what is the final medium in which heat is transmitted and even in what refrigerator is used. And another basic principle is also valid in all the heat pumps. The colder the primary heat source is, for example the air, and the greater the difference in temperature is to the final medium, the more the compressor needs to compensate by generating pressure to ensure that final desired temperature. 
and that means more energy is consumed. That is why air to water home heat pumps consume more when the outside temperature drops, but much less when the outside air is positive. Anyway, modern home heat pumps can work at as low as minus 25 degrees Celsius and even less, and although at such temperature efficiency would be lower, an average coefficient of performance would be at around 4, and even greater sometimes, which means that for every kilowatt hour of electricity consumed, a heat pump would generate about 4 kilowatt hour of heat transmitted to the final medium. Ok, but how do you adapt such a system, which is efficient also because it is close to the final point of dissipating and using the heat, to the size of the central heating system of the city, that needs to send the heat through kilometers of pipes and therefore has losses and needs a higher temperature on exit? What needs to be changed to keep it efficient and viable? We have a world first system here, uh, heat pump uh, heating a whole city, a whole area. What is similar to a home heat pump and what differentiates it? Well, there's in reality not much actually differentiate. The only thing that, that's the real big difference is the size. <laughs> it's the same principle from a, you can say, from a technical point of view. In your heat pump in the home, you have a compressor, it's just a little bit bigger. There will be a heat exchanger that will exchange the heat to the, the house, the water that you circulate in your heating devices in your house. That's the, 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 the heat exchanger you have here. Um, of course, the, the difference here is the source of energy. We use seawater as the, the, the energy source, whereas a lot of heat pumps you have in your domestic homes will use air, or some will even have some, uh, you say, uh, heating uh, pipes that you bury into the ground where you take the heat out. But most will be based on air. So that's, that's a big difference. If we were going to use air for this one, uh, that was technically also possible, but then we will need to put some heat exchangers out that took the, the heat out of the air. And it will, for the same amount of heat, be like two to three football courts of, uh, you can say, cooling devices. Um, and we did not find that feasible, uh, also because they make a lot of noise and take up a lot of space. Um, so we have water, and there the density, you can say there's, there's 4,000 times as much energy in a kilo of water than there is in air. So it makes more, more reason, much more reasonable to use water. And it's very much available here. So that's why we decided to use water. So the first big difference besides the size is in the heat source of this giant heat pump in Denmark. It is not the air, it is the sea water. It could have been the air, but then the giant fans and evaporators heat exchangers would need to be 2-3 football courts in size. But seawater was a much more interesting source of heat here, and maybe a much more stable one. Does it also provide any advantage to you because it doesn't go below zero as air sometimes does? Well, you can say water can in principle freeze, becomes ice. <laughs> So, uh, but the seawater out here is it's, it's extremely seldom that we do have ice and uh, you can say we, we take the water very close to the bottom of the harbor. So if there's a freezing you would have ice on the top and ice goes up, luckily not down. <laughs> and uh, so, so you can say the water in the bottom would always have a temperature which is one, two, yeah, one degrees. Theoretically it can drop down. Um, this is salt water. And uh, of course, depending on, on the content of salt, which varies a little bit, how much it rains and so on, the, 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 the freezing point is about one, minus 1 1.6. So when we take the water here and we, we cool it down by approximately 3 degrees, then of course we cannot go below the freezing point because then we we'll generate ice inside the heat exchanger. So we have to stay above. So if the temperature becomes very, very low, ultimately we will have to stop the machine. However, we have foreseen this when we made the project. <laughs> so we also have an opportunity here to take some, you can say, low temperature heat from our wood chip boiler and put that into the water so we can keep it in operation even if, you can say, we have very cold conditions. In the so by having seawater as a primary heat source, this heat pump in Denmark usually faces much more stable temperatures of minimum 1 degree Celsius or 33 Fahrenheit and almost never below that which is different from a home air to water heat pump that can have plus 5 today, minus 5 tomorrow and minus 17 the day after tomorrow. 
In a home heat pump the actual outside air temperature affects the cob, because there may be less heat to capture and the difference needs to be compensated by pressure from compressor. Here the air temperature may be minus 20 Celsius and it would be no problem, since the heat pump doesn't take the heat from air but from the sea, which is still above freezing point usually, so the cob is not affected too much and the heat pump remains more efficient. Still, there may be other parts of the circuit that can be affected by outside temperature. And you use CO2 as an agent inside the circuit. Why did you choose that? Well, the refrigerant, yes, it's CO2. Um, actually, when we started looking into this project, um, there are not that many suppliers. There's actually only one supplier who can supply a machine on CO2 this size. Um, we looked at different refrigerants. We wanted a heat pump. However, the number of suppliers out there is rather limited. So we decided to look at the very conventional refrigerant, which is ammonia. Uh, we looked at a synthetic refrigerant called R1334ZE, which is uh, yeah, synthetic made like a freon or whatever, just not uh, with the same greenhouse effect. And then we saw an opportunity to use CO2. So we went to the authorities and asked for environmental permit for all of these three uh, refrigerants. Um, for ammonia, there was restrictions uh, in terms of how much ammonia we can actually have in the plant uh, because it's explosive, it's toxic, and also ammonia is actually extremely toxic when it gets into water. Very, very small concentrations will kill all the fish. So uh, there was a lot of requirement from the authorities that we should be able to detect and prevent ammonia from going out. So we have placed, you can see here, the, the location of the heat pump is actually a little bit inland. So we take the water from one and we discharge it very far out. And one of the reasons why we brought it inland was that we needed a long discharge pipe. So if, for instance, ammonia got into the water, we could close a damper in the outlet so the ammonia would not get into the sea and kill the fish. Then the other refrigerant we looked at was uh, R1234, which is synthetic. Um, it is approved uh, refrigerant. Um, However, the bidders with it were not the best ones, but also from the environmental authorities, they looked at this refrigerant saying, okay, it's not a natural substance. Um, if it gets out of the machine, if it gets into the water, um, it will stay there forever. There's no, the, the mechanisms of breaking down this is uh, UV, and, and as you get sufficiently deep in the water, there's no UV. So if it was, if we had a spill, it would stay there forever. So the authorities came with the same conclusion. If you have a spill of this, you need some sort of preventing mechanism to be built in. CO2, on the other hand, is completely natural in the environment. If it gets into the water, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> so uh, for us, that was a big advantage when we looked at the technical installations. Then there are other advantages. You can say uh, ammonia is clearly, the, from a thermodynamical point of view, the most efficient. Um, CO2 is interesting in another way because it's actually a supercritical machine. So we have, uh, in the evaporator, we have two phases. We have a liquid and gas, but when it gets out, we get above the critical point. So uh, the CO2 can actually be expanded. So on the compressor behind us, there's a compressor stage, but also a turbine. So uh, once we have cooled the CO2 in the heat exchanger, we expand the CO2 through a a, a turbine, which actually puts more power on the shaft, so it means that the overall efficiency is much higher. So that's another point where it differs from your typical home installation. So the second big difference in this huge heat pump system is using CO2 as a refrigerant inside the circuit instead of R134A, R32 or ammonia. It is mainly for environmental reasons, but can the refrigerant ensure a similar efficiency? Can a huge heat pump that heats an entire city have a similar cope with a home heat pump? Having the CO2 in the system actually uh, uh, gets it a bit less efficient comparing to the classic refrigerant? No. Um, initially, you can say, with the, with, the, with the help of the turbine on the shaft here, we ended up with having, basically we had three different technologies, as I said, one based on ammonia, one based on this synthetic, and one based on, uh, on CO2. And uh, at the end of the day, the COP, you say the coefficient yeah. of the efficiency, was more or less the same for these technologies. That was not the deciding point. The other things where we looked in, in terms of picking a supplier was of course the environmental issues, there was price, but 
What we also use this plant for, and tend to use it for, is to sell grid balancing services, which means that we use a lot of electricity. This one will take like 12 megawatt of electricity, this compressor when it runs. And um, with the increased amount of solar and wind we put into the electricity grid, which is not, you can say, very predictable electricity producers, um, there's, a, there's a requirement for big electrical consumers that can, you can say, change their load very fast and this compressor can do this so that was another criteria where you can say this technology was superior it has nothing to do with the co2 it has more to do with the supplier MAM who has a you can say a good technical solution so with about 12 megawatt of electricity needed for one compressor and with two compressors in the entire system it can absorb about 24 to 25 megawatt of power from the grid when it operates at full capacity. Maurice, the project manager for implementing this heat pump from one side, showed us the electrical room to handle the entire power needed for the plant. You have seen our nice, quite tiny compressor. Yeah. But that's the system behind to get it running. Each compressor has one MV transformer and one uh, VFD. Each VFD well, is uh, are four different kind of panels which are combined, mounted together, and uh, each unit has two of those nice things. <coughs> they are also water cooled. Also on that one, we have here cooling water inlet and outlet, cooling water, and it has a separate cooling water system. So. Uh, there are a lot of tubing also inside and that needs to be commissioning as well. Huh? Electrical power, yes, in general, installation here is so far done, but before any kind of electricity can be entered that room, except uh, lightning, a lot of tests has to be done before. Huh? Well, having seen the equipment to manage the electrical consumption of this giant heat pump, let us see how much heat it can produce out of the electrical power it consumes. So, returning to the key parameter of COP, the coefficient of performance. Oh, what would be the coefficient of performance here? It depends on the temperatures. So of course it depends on the temperature of your, your heat supplier, in this case the water, yeah. and it depends on the temperature of, you can say, the district heating that we produce. So from the, from the lower bottom it's just about 2.8 or so, up to a little more than 4, depending on, on oh. where we are. Um, what we have done in the plant is, as you can say, the lower the, the production temperature of this to heat is, the higher the COP. So there are more, you can say, production units in this plant. So there's one operation mode where we actually put the, the production here in series with our wood chip boiler, which means that this one will take it up halfway and the wood chip boiler will take it up the other half in the temperature increase. That means that the COP becomes much higher. Well, we all have just heard about a wood chip boiler that is also present at the plant. Keep that in mind because we will return to it a bit later. Turns out there is an entire system of subsystems here, not only the giant heat pump. What's the temperature of the water on exit to the heating system? The heating system temperature dependent on the time of the year. <laughs> so uh, in the winter we would typically produce between 85 up to 90 degrees. You can say in, in all production, yeah, when we send it to, to our customers, 85, 90 degrees. In the summer, 72, 75. And that's also important here because we, we basically use the heat pump to produce as low as possible temperature. So in the summer, um, you can say we only need to mix a little bit of hot water to get there. Uh, the heat pump can provide up to, uh, to 75 degrees, it actually can provide up to 90 degrees. But we have two operation modes where it supplies the high temperature and supplies a medium temperature. When we send heat out to our customers, we mix these two. So we, uh, by mixing a hot and a sort of a not so hot temperature, we get to the, the, you can say the customer's temperature. And the heat pump will produce the, the not so hot <laughs> water. And then of course, uh, that gives us some advantages in the summer because then the seawater is, is warm and we don't need to send the temperature out so much. And that's where we get up to four or so in COP. Whereas in the winter, when uh, you can say uh, the water is cold and we need to put a high temperature out, then the COP is not so cold. 
This is a charming old city and that means its heating system pipes are also old and can have losses. Heating pumps usually provide their heat closer to the final medium of dissipating it to avoid that losses. So I was curious to find out how can the new giant heat pump operate with the current system of the city. All the pipes out in the city, they are the same. But as a part of this project and building this, we have also built a new pumping station. And the reason why the pumping station is that we need to change the principle of how we obtain the temperature to the customers. In the old days, you will have a hot production, typical 95 degrees or so, and then you take your return line and then you mix some return water in and lower it to the, to the customers. Here, you can see all the return goes this way through the heat pump and then we get this somewhat intermediate temperature, 60 degrees or so, which we mix with 90 degree water that we produce on our wood chip boiler, electrical boiler or other, which we send out to our customers. So in, in that sense, and all we do to keep the COP on this high, so we have as high as efficiency as possible. So we have changed the way we distribute the water as well to accommodate this machine. So yes, we have now the confirmation that this state-of-art giant heat pump is providing central heating in the city through the same old pipes of Jesberg, which means no other city would have the excuse to say that it has an old system, so it wouldn't be suitable for a high-tech heat pump. But at the same time, we hear now again that there is an additional cheap wood boiler in the system that can handle a part of the heating load or top up the temperatures when needed. So we must dig a bit deeper to understand why it is needed, what else is also helping the heat pump and when. I guarantee you it gets intriguing up to a point where we can see that this Danish system is a genius use of resources. Each of this plant can produce about 70 a megawatt. Depends a little bit where you are on the, on the low curve, about 70 megawatt these two compressors. Um, on the coldest day here, Typical cold day, we about 350 megawatt, so it's insufficient. We have different producers of heat in our system. In the bottom, we have a waste to energy plant. It's by law in Denmark, has always priority because we want to burn the waste for hygienic reasons, and we want to, of course, utilize the heat. Then, second priority is, we can say, the heat pump, the wood chip boilers that will go in on top of that. And if we have to go even further, uh, you can say for those very few hours where it's extremely cold, we have gas boilers and so on. So when we build a you can see heat pump like this, because it is a relatively expensive machine per megawatt it can produce. Whereas a gas boiler is very cheap per megawatt it can produce. So we look of course how many operation hours will we have. And in this case we're looking about five five and a half thousand six thousand operation hours per year so uh, but if we are going all the way up to to cover the last you can say 1500 hours where it's extremely cold we will have to build double size or triple size but we will be paying a lot a lot of money for something we wouldn't utilize so it's always a financial optimization to find the right size for the base load plants and you can say find the cheap peak load plants but accepting the fuel is expensive and that is an optimization you do when you look into your load, your future scenarios and so on. So we have estimated and we have found that this is the, the right size. So now the picture of the system gets complete. The first to act always is a waste to energy plant, which burns the city waste to produce heat because the existing waste needs to be burned. The second and the main part of the load is covered now by the giant heat pump, which can heat on its own the water up to 90 degrees Celsius on exit. But it usually doesn't heat to 90, providing something around 65 to 75 degrees for the sake of sticking to a much better cop. All the returning water from the city gets back into the heat pump condenser, also called the high temperature heat exchanger, where the heat pump is transmitting its heat to the final medium so the heat pump needs to ensure the increment of the loss difference to the desired temperature. We have uh, four levels. Two of them are this, the cold water supply, let's say like that. It's something like 50, 55 degrees. And our outlet then is 90. So basically the water returns from the system, from the city? Or well, that's say like 55 about, yeah? Yeah, 55 to 60 degrees. This is Roughly the value. 
And when it is colder outside, it is more efficient to use the wood chip boiler to heat a smaller amount of water to 99 degrees for example and then mix that almost boiling water with the 75 degrees water exiting the heat pump and obtaining a mix of 90 degrees. In that way the cop of the heat pump is kept at a very good level and the wood chip boiler basically burns wood waste, releasing only CO2 that have been previously captured. And the fourth part, the gas boiler, is basically a top-up solution, reserved just for the extreme cold days when the other solutions wouldn't manage to ensure an efficient heating. So for all the 99% of the usage we have city waste as source, then renewable electricity, then wood waste. And the genius usage of resources doesn't end here, as there is something more to see in this system and we'll soon get there. Well, you would never hear that a home heat pump would be able to provide 90 degrees temperature for the water on exit with compressor only, because it doesn't need to and it usually wouldn't be able to. But this giant heat pump in Denmark can do that. So there must be something truly special about its two compressors. Compared to other compressors, if you look at it from the side, you can say you will not see any electrical motor here. The motor is actually integrated, so the electrical motor is inside the casing and the motor is, uh, you can say, uh, it's an integrated part. It sits on the same shaft as you have the compressor, which are, are basically just a centrifugal or turbo compressors. They're like the size of a <laughs> plate, <laughs> basically, and there are four stages in here. And in the other end of the shaft you have the, uh, the, the expander, the little turbine. The electrical engine is cooled by, you can say, CO2, so everything is enclosed, it's a completely closed machine. Um, there's no gearbox in here, so the electrical motor, the, the speed of electrical motor comes from a frequency converter, whereas the old technology you would have a gearbox, you can say, a, a traditional el electrical motor, a gearbox, and then you would have the, the compressor on the side. All of this is enclosed. The bearings in here are magnetic bearings, so... Uh, there is no mechanical contact between the rotating shaft and the housing. So there's no a, it, it's basically by levitation, so it's actually friction free. It's only the friction which is generated by the, the CO2 gas which is in there. So of course it needs a little bit of cooling. So you can say of course some, some CO2, cold CO2 is put in there to, to cool uh, whatever friction you will have there. But in, in, you can say, so in that sense, it's a very, very intelligent compressor and also extremely reliable because there is no gearbox. But well, what breaks down is the gearbox and so on. Of course, uh, the VFD, the, the, the frequency converter, you can break down. But, but in principle, you made a very, very simple machine here and you take a lot of complexity out. But that's sometimes the beautiful of things that, that, that works very well. They are in principle very simple. That is simple but state of the art at the same time. Magnetic bearings, basically levitation, and thanks to that, an almost total lack of internal friction. A special membrane that can ensure impermeability at higher pressure. It is a Hofim hermetically sealed compressor made by MAN Energy Solutions. What we see that, that is made, uh, designed and fabricated in Switzerland. Yeah. Uh, it's also written here where it's come from. Huh? In the middle of Zurich. Is the one of the oldest, and I'm not missing it. It's one of the oldest uh, industrial spots in in Zurich center, more or less. Uh, um, one side is the compressor. In the middle, we have the motor, and on the right, we have then the expander. Suction side is on top, means all the fresh CO2 is coming from the top, going through the comp uh, compressor, and then uh, on the downside, compressed straight in the heat exchanger where then the hot CO2 is going or the heat is trans transmitted then into the um, uh, water. DH water, the district heating water. What would be the lifetime expectancy of this machine? When you come back to us in 30 years it's still here. As there are in the machine there are no mechanical contact points. When it runs you have very very little wear and tear. So, Service intervals would be about five years. So every five years the compressor will be dismounted, put on the truck, driven down to man in, in Zurich, and they will open up, take it apart, and they will have a look. And if there's anything where there are some unusual wear and tear, they will fix it. But to be quite honest, 
I don't think you'll see much because there are no mechanical contacts. Of course, there are places that will come a little bit hot in there, but as long as things work, wear and tear is, is minimal on a machine like this. Which is actually also one of the reasons why we chose them. If you have taken ammonia based system, they will be using screw compressors, and uh, those you have to maintain every 1500 hours or so. Here, you do nothing. So no serious repairs are expected for at least 30 years, only maintenance. And one of the last pieces of the genius puzzle here is the energy. Where does the electricity come from? How much does the system consume? And how it can maximize efficiency in consumption and costs? Electricity here comes from the grid. So uh, on the other side of this building there is a, a, a station, a power station which takes 60 kilovolts in. We step this down to 10 kilovolts over there. It goes up to transformers up here and sends, uh, you can say, power down to the motor here, which is about, if I recall it correctly, about 700 volts or so that goes into the machine. So we get it from the public grid. And the public grid in Denmark is one of the greenest in its energy mix, with a share of renewables approaching to 90% and with a tremendous rise, mainly thanks to wind power. Have you made any calculation during a winter month uh, in your typical operation, which is intended, like balancing and everything, how much would the heat pump system, system consume in of megawatt hour? Yes, megawatt hour. It, it will consume about 25 megawatt hour per hour. Wow. So you can say, uh, and you will be running more or less full load for, for three months. That means 25 megawatt hour multiplied by 24 hours and multiplied by 90 days which results in 54,000 megawatt hour for both compressors for the entire heat pump system, or 18,000 megawatt hour per winter month. For the entire year, a number which is even more relevant and balanced, this heat pump would consume about 90,000 megawatt hour of electricity. A Vesta's 15 megawatt offshore wind turbine, located in some usual favorable area of sea near Denmark, would produce up to 80 to 87,000 megawatt hour of electricity per year. So one such wind turbine would cover almost entirely the annual electricity needed for this giant heat pump to operate. But since the electricity comes from the grid here, we find out that the plant operator can choose when to consume to benefit from the most convenient price and sometimes even gets paid for the electricity it consumes. But it is a substantial amount of electricity. And we will be buying, depending on the market, you can say that that's the other thing with the machine here, is that the market here in Denmark is, is a spot market that you buy the electricity on, and you have prices from hour to hour basis. So we will of course look into the market, <laughs> and for every hour we will calculate the heat production price. So if, you can say, if electricity prices for some reason, which happens once in a while, gets extremely high one hour, then we just shut it off. And, and basically what is one of the beauties with this machine that you can just push the button and 30 seconds later it's out and you can push it again and 30 seconds afterwards it's on full load again from an electrical consumption point of view. So we can, we can start and stop this machine from hour to hour. So uh, when we do a load planning, we will go in and see we have different, as I said, we have different production modules. And of course, we will say, okay, today we're going to supply 120 megawatt. Then we will calculate today the gas price is this, the electricity price this hour, and so on. And we will, of course, make a production mix, which is the cheapest in that specific hour. So that also means that typical operation here, you will see that this machine will run in the middle of the day, because then the solar is there, and then it will typically run in the night, where you can say uh, people are sleeping and are not uh, watching television or whatever they do, so electricity consumption is low. So you'll, you'll find that the, the, the operation pattern here will on and off, simply depending on the, uh, the price of electricity. And you have a heat uh, uh, storage for that? We have a heat accumulator next to us, we have a, a big storage tank of 2500 megawatt hours, so our you can say our consumption in the grid does not have to match our production. So we don't need a, you can say, second for second balancing of our consumers and our production. The tank here allows us to have a very large, actually, we can have several hours. And in, in the summer, we could actually, in principle, have days. <laughs> so we can, we can produce the heat two days before it actually has to be consumed. The window is a little bit more tight, but we still have a room like six, seven hours we can work with. So you, you can cover the high demand period of the day? Yes, 
basically we, we will, of course, if it's very, very cold, everything has to run. But most of the time, you will see we have operation period where a pattern where we will start and stop depending on the electricity market. But it also helps the market. We have to understand that, that we will put more consumption in when prices are low. This actually a little bit benefit to uh, to the one who own the wind turbines and the solar plants because they will get a little bit more payment <laughs> yeah. when uh, when the prices are low because we are a very large consumer. And on the other side, when the prices are, are high, we'll take you say consumption away that will lower the peak prices hopefully a little bit <laughs> so it doesn't become that expensive so the something more part that completes the system here is the heat storage system that can store 3500 megawatt hour of heat at heating power required from the system in winter and considering some losses it can ensure minimum six seven hours of heat delivery and in summer it can ensure days of storage in case you are wondering about central heating in summer, this is Denmark, a Nordic country, so there is some heating providing during summer nights as well. Anyway, this heat storage allows the entire system to take the electricity from the grid when the demand and price is at its lowest, while avoiding putting additional pressure when the demand is highest. Not only it is cost efficient, but it helps balancing the system, including in moments of peak overproduction from renewables helping them with an extra demand. And the most fascinating part here is that during such moments, the grid actually may pay the district heating plant here to use the electricity and to take the pressure out of the system. How genius is that? We have a contract for, for different types of balancing services. We haven't started them yet for obvious reasons that is not yeah. running. But there are different types of balancing services that we will provide. One is, uh, you say, primary balancing. Basically, <coughs> we will measure the frequency of the grid, and if the frequency of the grid become, goes outside a very, very narrow band, up or down, uh, meaning if it goes up, then you can say there's too much electricity put in. If the frequency goes down, the consumption is too big, then we can adjust our machines accordingly to support that. That's typically a 5 megawatt band or even more 10 megawatt band. We're doing automatic regulation that we are paid for. We can also put you can say uh, uh, secondary uh, support where basically the grid company calls us to say now you have to go up and go down. All goes automatically, if not by the phone, it actually goes by, you can say, a wire <laughs> and so on. Uh, so that, that's one opportunity as well where we will go in and sell these services. So we say, okay, we can deliver you plus minus 10 megawatt, for instance, if you run. Um, and then they can call us up and down. And then there's the ultimate very last is that in our uh, transformer station, the grid company actually has access to our switches. So if the grid is really in trouble, then they can go in and turn off in a prioritized way our switches. If it, that's really the last resort, if, you know, if they're really, really in trouble, then they can shut this one down, the shut electrical boiler and so on down. They can do that without our interference, basically. Well, in the beginning I said that this heat pump will allow the city of Esberg to give up using coal for district heating. So how big will the impact in saved CO2 be thanks to that? We are building this complete plant um, because the, the coal-fired power station here is going to stop in operation. And I believe you can say that the machine here is about 300,000 tons of CO2 per year that will not be emitted there when we put this. So in, in, you can say it, it's, it's a big chunk also compared to, uh, to the national targets of them in, in terms of CO2 reduction. So that's quite good. Would you be confident to recommend this technology for cities around the world to get rid of uh, burning? Uh, fossil fuels maybe or at least sure especially this this will work give us a little bit of time and we'll be there so yes it will work it is a good solution but of course you need a district heating network you can say this uh, this installation here all in all is like 40 million euro or so um, our district heating network is probably 10 times as much the value of all the pipes in the ground so if if a city wants to, to go through this to heating, they have to understand that there's also a large investment to put the pipes in the ground. In Denmark and most of the Sweden, we have done this for years, it's part of our, our energy infrastructure. But if uh, you go to 
other places in the world that's not the energy in infrastructure. So of course it works and we provide you can say cheap and reliable heat to our customers, but there's there's another big decision you have to do before you can 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 do this. So from a technical point of view, I think it's a very good solution, and I think it will uh, it will help integrate renewable energy because we can help balance and, and get it there. So this sector coupling makes a lot of sense, but it's not just a question about buying one of these. <laughs> there's a few other things that has to be in, in, in place before that's possible. So how many customers, uh, homes and uh, inhabitants? Do you provide heat too with this system? We have, I think, 25,000 meters. Uh, so our force, our customer is a meter where we actually measure it. If you look at the number of people, I think it's about 100,000 people that we provide heat to. So what we have here is the world's first heat pump system of this scale and type in central heating system, pioneering in a city with 25,000 homes and 100,000 inhabitants, making possible to completely exclude coal and save 300,000 tons of CO2 per year. In fact, speaking of applying this system to other cities, Denmark has already decided to implement the same system at a scale three times bigger in another city, Alborg, with 220,000 inhabitants. There, the heat pump will be able to provide 99 degrees Celsius for the water at exit and the same compressors as here will be used. If we do some basic math for the system we saw today in Esberg, assuming that the city already has a pipe system, the 40 million euro cost divided by 25,000 homes results in a theoretical cost of 1,600 euro per home, which is less than average home heat pump costs. If we count only the electricity, the 54,000 megawatt hour of electricity per coldest part of the winter season, not taking in consideration burning of waste and cheap woods, and divided by 25,000 homes, we have a theoretical average of 2.16 megawatt hour per home per coldest part of winter season, but that is not the complete energy consumed. If you think that number could be lower, that is because of the losses of transporting heat through pipes in an entire city, comparing to a home heat pump. But even if you think that it could be equal or higher, the huge benefit here is that the whole system runs basically on renewable energy and has just made possible to exclude 300,000 tons of CO2 in emissions without having to put a completely new pipe system in an old and charming city. A home heat pump would probably consume less energy per home. But with this solution, Esberg took action in one move, changing an entire city from coal heating to heat pump and its additional components to balance the system. A big change in one bold move. That is the key here. And it was possible thanks to advanced, large-scale engineering and wise system balancing. Thank you for watching. Subscribe to What Energy channel and see you soon.